with the session. Um, if anyone else comes in after, it'll be fine. So hi, thanks for attending my talk. Um, and thanks for attending WordCamp Toronto. This is so great. My name is Andrea, and I'll be presenting Storytelling with Gutenberg, um, which is basically how to use the new editor. Yes. I don't think they're, I think it's just for the camera. Yes. Um, but if, am I projecting enough? Do you? Yeah? Thank you. Um, so my talk, I'm not a developer by any means. I am a content writer. I study journalism. So this talk is going to be basically how to use the new editor um, as a content creator, as a blogger. And I'm going to take a very positive spin on Gutenberg. So if you have some tough questions for me at the end, just know that uh, I am not a developer and I am one of those people that's going to be encouraging you to use Gutenberg as much as possible. In my last session, I thanked the organizers of WordCamp Toronto um, for inviting me, but I also want to thank all the volunteers that are taking time to help us out here today. Um, I know volunteering at WordCamp is a lot of work, and I really appreciate that. And thanks to our sponsors as well. So, st storytelling with Gutenberg. Can you guys see the slides? I know there's like a light right above it. Um, whoa. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like one or the other, isn't it? There's no in between. Yeah, there is no in between. Ah, great. That's great. Um, so storytelling with Gutenberg. I tried to stay on theme with, uh, with my slides and, and make it kind of cute. So uh, yeah, my name is Andrea Zollner. I work for SiteGround, which is a sponsor this weekend. Um, you can find me on Twitter at my handle there. I'm a journalism major, like I mentioned. So writing is my, is my trade. And I'm excited about Gutenberg. I'm one of the I won't say few people, a lot of people are excited about Gutenberg, but I am one of those optimistic types um, that's excited to see all the things that we can do with this new tool. Um, so I've presented myself and shared a couple of things about myself. Uh, what about you? Have you used Gutenberg? Who in the room? So that you not that many. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm hoping by the end of my talk you feel pumped and excited and you're going to leave here and think about all the things that you can do on your own blog that go online. Um, to be making the most of Gutenberg. So if you're new to the WordPress space, or at least new to this whole new editor uh, debate, then just briefly, what's going to happen when WordPress 5.0 is released, which can happen you know, in a matter of weeks, um, is that we're going to get a brand new editing experience. So this is what you're probably used to at the moment, um, the, the editor that we currently have in 4.9.8. Uh, and then what you're going to have is this new design, and it's really based on a block system, which we'll, we'll tackle a little bit further in this talk. Um, and so a lot of the things are going to be familiar. They're going to have the same labels, but they're going to look slightly different, and you're going to have a whole new set of tools to work with as well. Uh, and this impacts a lot of themes and plugins, so the whole WordPress community is involved in this. This is why it's such a huge topic. It's not just, oh, we're, we've you know, added some tools. No, this is a big change to the WordPress core software. So it's impacting a lot of businesses, a lot of developers, and that's why it's such a, a big uh, deal. You, if you've updated to 4.9.8, you've probably seen this prompt that was at the top of your dashboard, which encouraged users to download the Gutenberg plugin. So before it became part of core, um, people had an opportunity to actually look at you and your customers for plugin developers and businesses that use WordPress to make money and also for individual users like myself and my personal blog who just kind of wanted to know if there were going to be any issues with that using it and also getting to know the tools so that I could make the most of it. Um, and so the Try Gutenberg button is that's how they got people to test it out. And what's going to happen is we've been told by the Gutenberg development team that when 5.0 comes out, uh, you, it's going to be Gutenberg is going to be the default editor, but you can also install the classic editor. So that's the experience that we all have right now in our WordPress installations. And so if you're not ready for Gutenberg, then we have the classic editor that you can install. And so you can choose which editor you want to be using come in, in the future. And you can sw you know, switch between both of them, or maybe there's some pages of your content that you'd rather just not have to learn Gutenberg for right away. So it's up to you. You have some options there to learn at your own pace and to adopt Gutenberg when it's right for you. But again, I'm excited about it. So I'm going to be encouraging you to, to use it to test it out as much as possible. Is anyone familiar with the term? It's one of those terms that has come about really recently, and it's pretty much just 
a jargon jargony term that exists within the digital media publishing world. Um, but Two Snowfall came about because uh, a couple of years ago, the New York Times came out with this micro site, this micro bit of reporting um, about this big avalanche that happened in Washington State. And it was this really big avalanche. A lot of people died. It was like a, a big news story. But instead of just reporting on it, you know, with a couple of pictures, they, they developed this really cool website uh, called Snowfall. And so it was this super dynamic piece of reporting that they had the main reporter who was writing all the text, but they had videographers. They had, you know, a whole team of digital developers that were making really cool, uh, like, interactive maps and it was just one of those <coughs> things that no one had seen before. So it came out on December 20th, 2012. I was in my final year of journalism, I think. And it was just, it kind of like took us by storm, pun intended, it was just amazing. Um, everyone was talking about how interactive it was and how multimedia it was and how it made reporting so much more interesting. And for an industry that was supposedly dying, the New York Times had 2.9 million visitors on their site, a third of which were brand new to the New York Times. So not only were they getting their readers interested, they were getting these people that weren't even ever subscribers or visitors to their website coming to the New York Times um, website because of Snowfall. It actually won a 2013 Pulitzer Prize for being the best reporting of the year. And a lot of people quote it as being a game changer or revolutionizing the way that we look at digital media and digital reporting. So these are just like, I just kind of scroll through it, but there are so many tabs and so many parts of this. And I really encourage you to look it up um, on your own time because it's just a really cool way of taking stories, taking something that could be quite static and turning it into something super engaging and multimedia. So I looked into the tech behind it a little bit. And um, of, you know, you'll recognize a lot of things that are like jQuery underscore jplayer, a lot of HTML5, which was really hot at the time. Um, and it's you know, based on a lot of trigger, the, like scroll-based events, basically, that borrow from a jQuery plugin. Um, and so I'm going to be bold here and uh, say that with Gutenberg, anyone can snowfall. Um, so I mean, it became a term to snowfall because you know, when this came out, I remember being in my college you know, newsroom and whatever. We talked about, like, so that story, are we going to snowfall that? We should do a snowfall. And so it just became a verb and a, an adjective for how we were going to go about reporting. Um, but what I'm saying is that you know, maybe you don't have a team of digital designers that you're working with. Maybe you are your own webmaster, your own content creator, your own business owner, you're by yourself. But with the tools that Gutenberg is adding to WordPress, you can now create really immersive interesting, multifaceted storytelling pieces, just like Snowfall. You can start to build off of your text and to build in interviews and really interesting photo galleries and all these tools without the help of a developer. You can do it yourself. So let's take a look at Gutenberg really quickly, just so you get a picture of you know, what it's going to look like and what might change from our current experience. So on the right here, we have a document tab which I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of talks on Gutenberg, so I don't want to overlap too much with what other people are doing. But really briefly, you know, we have a lot of the same uh, controls that we had on the previous dashboard, like tags, categories, featured image. But there's a whole new block at the top, um, whole new block, whole new tab at the top called block. And that is specific to Gutenberg because it's a block-based design. And what I mean by that is that when you are in the editing space itself, you can click on the plus button and then you have options of blocks to add to that editing space. So whether you choose a paragraph or a heading, um, that's just like very basic ones, but there's lots of different blocks that you can add. And once you choose that block, then you can edit the specific block itself with this new tab on the side. So you can uh, control the uh, text size and add a background color and uh, a lot of other things. And you know, if you add a CSS class to it, then you can do way more things as well. And so here's just quickly some of my favorite Gutenberg blocks um, that, have, that come sort of built into it already. But because a lot of plugin developers are building new tools for Gutenberg, you'll see the blocks just become a lot more in the coming months, I'm sure. A lot of people are working on new blocks to fit into their plugin at the moment. So um, I feel like it's just going to grow and grow. This list is going to grow and grow and grow. But for the time being, I sort of grouped them together in a couple of categories. So my text blocks, which are um, for editing text specifically, like lists and headings and subheaders, tables, buttons that have text in them, 
uh, and your classic block, which is just sort of the editor as we know it, media, which is image, audio, video, quotes, which is stylized text, you know, and, and cool things we can do with quotes and pull quotes, uh, layouts, which I'm very excited about because laying things out when you're not good at HTML is a nightmare, and so um, having some layout blocks is really helpful. And then code, if you want to add code, inject it right into the editor, you can use some code blocks for that. So now how do we use these tools? How can we improve the blogs that we operate today, whether it's our personal blogs or for an organization that you work for, for your clients? Um, and again, you know, I'm teaching this, assuming you're going to implement them yourselves, but you may have clients that are asking you these questions. And so these are tips that you can also share with them. Uh, and the first tip that I have is, I mean, the first step really is adding style to your text. This is, this is a basic one. Um, you know, in the editor that we have, sure, we can bold, we can, we can italicize, we can play with colors. If we get into the CSS, we can add some stuff. But now it's built right into Gutenberg, and we don't really have to uh, bend over backwards to stylize our text. And stylizing our text is something that I encourage everyone to do because people have really short attention spans. Reading walls of text is not that interesting. And, it, and it, people lose uh, interest in your content if there isn't a flow, there isn't a hierarchy of the information, there isn't something for them to look at and to remember really quickly. And so by stylizing your text, you're not only going to increase the time that they spend on your page, you're going to increase the success rate of your page because they're going to be retaining more information. Uh, so these are some of the things that you can add to diversify the text that you have on your site. So you can use pull quotes. If you have specific information or, or uh, quotes that are really interesting that you want to have highlighted, that's a stylized thing. Verse as well, if you're quoting books um, or passages or poetry, you can stylize it with a verse. Lists is a basic one. Columns is a really interesting one. So if you are doing something that's a little bit more like publishing focused, uh, you can now build in columns into your text and have a diversity of layouts right in your text, kind of like a newspaper, without having to hard code anything yourself. Uh, quotes I mentioned, heading, you know, just again, adding diversity and structure to your content is always a good idea. So text elements in Gutenberg kind of look like this. I mean, I kind of built a very simple, stupid example, but uh, these are all blocks. So you have your paragraph block, that's a column block, so I've divided it into two um, headings, some lists, uh, a little pull quote. So all of this you see, every time I click on a block, there's some new um, ways that you can edit it that pop up under here on the, the block tab. And then when you preview it, it just kind of like adds some really fun, some, some fun diversity. This is kind of a bad example because I wouldn't do this naturally, but I'm just trying to show you all the different blocks smushed into one. The next tip is to diversify your images. So uh, a lot of themes do this for you. You know, I rely heavily on my theme design for the way that images appear on my site. But now I have a little bit more control, which is a double-edged sword because sometimes the theme designers don't want to give you the control because they want things to look good. And with Gutenberg, now we have all these options to add way more images and, and to really control the way that our pages look. But I think it's good. I think more control is better for the end user. Um, and so diversifying your images means that you can use blocks to not only create one image, but you can stretch that image and have something that's like a full width. You can create galleries, um, and you can also embed really easily from a lot of third-party image uh, websites. So if you are a big fan of Instagram, Flickr, or you host your images elsewhere, uh, you can save on your you know, resources and the space that you have on your website by embedding from third-party applications um, and without having to import everything if that's not what you want to be doing. So, I mean, of course, I think as a content creator, I think images are really powerful. So the more images that you have that really support your messaging, the better your website's going to be. And with Gutenberg, we have a lot of like diversity of options. So this one's just like a basic gallery, and then we have you know sort of a header image that you can actually write on top of. So I know as a content creator, I, I've spoken to a lot of social media managers who love Canva and who love using these platforms where you can pick an image and then add text over it, and you don't have to get into Photoshop, and you don't have to use these expensive and hard to learn softwares. Um, and so now in Gutenberg, it's built in that if you want to add just text over an image with a little bit of like a shading, you can do that without going outside of WordPress, which is super cool. 
And then if you want to expand on the use of your image blocks, you can also get creative and turn them into like sort of pseudo buttons. So if you have like a services page, for example, and you want to have different services laid out in a really neat and tidy way, you can use a gallery to do that and have these buttons designed um, yourself and import them as an image and then create these really cool so like menus using the image blocks. The third one is to integrate other post types. So this one is kind of, it's not self-explanatory just like from the get-go, but it's actually really powerful. And the reason is that, you know, when you're building your website, you have a lot, likely you have a lot of content on your website and you don't want that content to get buried. You want to be able to control how it's presented. You want to group content together based on theme or um, based on intent or based on your audience type. And so having more control over how you integrate different post types is really powerful. And I'll show you uh, exactly what I mean. And so I think most of us are familiar, well, I won't say most, but short codes is something that's been built into WordPress for a long time that we can use to pull in other post types that we have on our website. So the basic ones that I can, you know, you have your blog posts, that's the basic one. Um, testimonials, portfolio projects, these are ones that sort of come built into WordPress. And then if you're using a plugin that builds custom post types, well then you must, you probably have lots of them, like authors, and depending on what your site is about, you can have like an unlimited number of custom post types. And now you can pull those into your editing page and design these really awesome landing pages. And so this sounds kind of abstract, so I want to give you just like a very simple example for someone who has a portfolio. So if you have a portfolio, but you do lots of different things, you wear lots of different hats. Maybe you're a designer, but you also are a copywriter. You also uh, do infographics, or you, uh, consult with government agencies. Maybe you, you have multiple different things. So on your portfolio, you want to be able to create an experience for that particular type of client. You want to create a hub of information where one client that you might be going after would be able to see what you can do for them in that industry with that skill set. So with custom post types um, and with short codes, excuse me, you can then choose what you want to display on that page so you can customize the experience for that particular uh, context that you're creating. So here what I did is I built a portfolio landing page and I called it writing. And what I'm going to do is with a short code block, I'm going to pull in all of the articles that I've written that I've tagged um, writing. I mean, I could be more granular, but with this example, I'm just going to pull in writing. But if you wanted to use a specific tag, then you could pull in just the articles, just the post types that use that tag and that nomenclature. So, um, and then that just will pull in a really cool list of those particular blog posts. And what I've done, you know, in the past, in the, on the bottom here is some, some call to actions as well. So I can display the custom post types. I can then have a call to action to have the person who's viewing this go to another part of my website where I have more information. Um, you know, if they want to download something, I've added a little file there so they can download. So you can end up building these really cool landing pages within WordPress, within your site, um, that you've totally customized. And you've can do that on your own without the help of a developer, uh, without having to add extra plugins, and without having to tweak your theme yourself. So again, that's just like something really cool that I think is going to really open up the opportunities for content creators. Number four is to spice it up with multimedia. Um, this is kind of assuming that you have media. I know for a lot of people, they think video is awesome. They just don't have the resources to produce a lot of video on their own. Uh, but if that's something that you do want to get into, I highly recommend it. And WordPress makes it so much easier now with Gutenberg. So if you have a podcast, if you have, um, if you are a digital songwriter, I'm trying to think of things that you might have audio, uh, or if you have clips of things that you want to share on your website, now you can use the block uh, for audio and import it right away. Although if you have a podcast, I'd recommend having your podcast elsewhere um, <laughs> as well as on your website. But uh, video, again, you can use the video blog video block to add a really nice video player to your website. And uh, I mean, room permitting, I think a lot of video is heavy, so you might not want to host it on your own website. Uh, but if you have the odd video that you want to embed uh, or that you want to upload, you can. And then <coughs> otherwise, there's a lot of services built into Gutenberg where you can easily embed party from YouTube, from Vimeo, from any of those services. So here, yeah, this is something that I've uploaded. 
And then you have all of these options here, like autoplay, loop, mute. Um, and if you use Keynote, for example, if you have Mac, Mac users, it's kind of similar situation when you put a video in your presentation. You can really control how it's going to display. When someone scrolls down your page, if you're going to have the video autoplay, like we saw in Snowfall, um, or if people have to click on it. So that's just another way of improving your blog by adding more diversity and multimedia uh, to, your, to your blog content. Add breathing room. This is, um, again, like when we were looking at the list of blocks, I was really excited about the layout blocks because I think a lot of the time when someone's starting out using the WordPress editor, they're doing a lot of hard returns and they're doing a lot of like left aligned and this and, and they're, they're, not, they're never satisfied with the way that their content looks because they just don't have that much control over how it's going to show up. And with Gutenberg, they've built in these blocks that create white space and people really underestimate the power of white space on on a, on a blog, on a page of content. Again, the whole wall of text thing that people hate. Um, adding breathing room just allows your page to have more, um, just, it's just more appealing, uh, it's easier to read, it's more engaging. And so by having more control over how your text is displayed and how your content is displayed, it's just it overall just creates a really nice design. And you, you know, have to be a designer to do it now. So some of these blocks are like columns, like we mentioned being able to split up your content Having tables that are easy to create, easy to manage, that are responsive right out of the box. Those are, that's really something that's going to save me a lot of time. Page breaks. Uh, if you design your website in a way where you want to have multiple uh, pages in a page, it's hard to explain, but um, that's something. A lot of websites do that when they have advertisement because it makes more hits on their advertisement. But uh, page breaks is nice. Uh, spacer, the more, and the separator. These are just really simple blocks that can really make it easy to design your page uh, thoughtfully. And number six, build in a call to action. So I think a lot of people assume that call to actions are only for e-commerce sites or they're only for really marketing heavy sites. But the idea of a call to action is present everywhere. Um, you know, anytime someone asks you to do something, that's a call to action. So if you have a very basic, the contact me link that you have, you could turn that into a call to action button. You can get people to subscribe or to follow you, um, to view your articles, to download your CV. These are all call to actions. You want people to perform an action on your website. And now with Gutenberg, you can make those so much more than just a text link. You can actually have them pop out of your page and you don't have to go into the CSS to design something. You can do it right in Gutenberg. So for that, you know, for example, I'm adding a block and I'm adding a button block. And this is so nifty, it's really nicely designed. You can add the text, and then you have all these options on the side to change the color of the text, the background color, and I don't know if it's going to show up in my demo, but there's a really cool tool where if there's, ah, here it is. If the color combination is hard to read, it'll tell you. It'll tell you, you know, maybe you don't want to do lime on yellow. It's just going to be too hard for your readers to, to perceive. Um, and so you can really play around with the button block and then type in, you paste in your URL and you have the same controls as like in the past opening it in a new tab which I recommend and things like or if it's a website that's out of your site I recommend opening a new tab you can even change like how the corners are rounded all of this can be done without having to design it outside of WordPress you can also uh, create a call to action I'm trying to remember what I did in my demo you can also create a call to action by using images um, and so by using images you can let's see if I do it Pull quote, that was my next one. So pull quotes. Um, again, this is kind of a creative way of doing a call to action. Normally pull quotes are literally a quote, but if you just want to draw attention to one part of your text and you want to have someone uh, perform an action, a pull quote can be a nice way to really make it pop out of your page. So that's just another one. And again, like you can stylize this. I would try and be consistent from one page to the next. So if you have like all of these options are really exciting, but you can get carried away and end up having kind of a messy website. So I would recommend sticking to one or two of these options and repeating them on your pages throughout. So this is another way of using that image that I was talking about where you can add text and you can add a little color overlay. And so here, you know, I'm making a call to action that's a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more interesting to look at. And I'm playing around with the tools that are built into uh, Gutenberg to do that. 
And so this next tip is related to uh, your workflow. So uh, learning to use Gutenberg and implementing it, I, I don't want to take some uh, I'm not saying that this is like something that you're going to be able to totally embrace uh, from one day to the next and work into your workflow uh, entirely. For me, I've done it progressively. I have a couple of different websites. And so, um, you know, it sort of started with like, well, my next blog post, why don't I build it with, with Gutenberg? And so that's sort of how I started to get to know the, the tools and to implement the tools and get really excited about them. Uh, but one of the really cool things about Gutenberg is that you can build <laughs> blocks. So I mentioned sort of not going too crazy. Uh, okay. Uh, not going too crazy with the different blocks that we use and uh, sort of sticking to a couple of uh, looks and what you look for. Now, building blocks for Gutenberg or you have a designer that is helping you develop a style, you can get them to design you a couple of reusable blocks or you can design them yourself. So here I've just made like a purple block. And then I'm saving it and calling it purple content block. And then um, saving it. And so I can now reuse that block from page to page. So you could work with a designer, get them to develop some blocks for you. Maybe if you are a company that has a really strong Facebook presence, you want to get people to follow you on Facebook. <laughs> block that points people there and reuse that everywhere on your site uh, where it makes sense. So uh, if you have a marketing team that creates ads, and you have your content team, which is separate. You know, you can have your content team come in and work around the ads that are already built in, and your and your marketing team could come and just reuse the ads that have already been designed and add them on your page. So that's something that I think is going to end up saving me a lot of time when I'm creating content, and just be more effective as well. Yes. In HTML, you can create your own library mm -hmm. of of code. So if you want to get a certain look and feel, you just go into your library, copy paste it. Can you have that function with Gutenberg, like with these blocks? I assume so, because if you copy your HTML into your page, you could then save that block the way it is. Um, but Where would I save it? I guess your HTML would be impacting your entire page. Well, say, OK, so I've created this purple block Yeah. And uh, for, for client A. Now client B wants the same purple block. Yeah. So can I create, can I save that purple block in a library somewhere huh. like I do with HTML? I am not sure. That's a great question. And I will ask, there's so many great developers here that work with Gutenberg that I'd probably, I can find one. We can ask them what that's going to look like. My assumption is that all of these things that we're going to discover as we use Gutenberg more and more, someone's going to find a solution to. So if it's workflow related, things like that, then we're going to have some, someone's going to develop a plugin where you can save all of your blocks across a multi-site, for example. Um, or you know, if you manage multiple sites, you can export your blocks like you could with other, because a lot of other builders allow that, allow you to download what you've created and import it into another site. So I'm, I'm sure that we're going to get there with Gutenberg as well um, and to be able to repurpose what we've built from one site to the next. But yeah, I'm going to follow up with you because that's a great question. Already, I'm at the end of my talk. In summary, so what I want to say is stylize your text, add images, maximize your post types, make sure that you're making the most of all the content that you have on your website, that it's not getting buried, and that, you can, that you're making a user experience that's uh, really <coughs> dynamic and, and useful and powerful, and, gets, and makes your website as um, powerful as possible, helping you to achieve your goals. Add audio and video if you have that. Add white space so your website breathes. Add a call to action, whether it's a simple subscribe or follow or something a little bit more advanced. And create reusable blocks so that you can save yourself time. And when I'm talking about reusable blocks too, you know, if you have a whole team, if you have an editorial team, that's something that you, that you can determine as a group, uh, what are the blocks that we want to be reusing? And then you can instruct people. And it's going to make onboarding a lot more easy as well because a lot of the things are going to be templated and built into to Gutenberg already. So I'm happy to take any questions that you have. And if I cannot answer them, we will work on it this afternoon. Yes. Uh, oh, 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 yeah. You go first. Um, 
when you say you can save blocks, does the content carry over or just the style? The, both. You can, if you create just the content, uh, sorry, if you create just the block without any content in it, you can save that block by itself, mm -hmm. and then it becomes empty every time you reuse it. It's empty, or you can save it with the content. So it depends on what you use it for. And then when you choose, like when let's say you edit the content in one page, does it carry over to all the other pages? Uh, ooh, I'd have to test it out. I know that if you if you just have like the purple block with no content, and you add content in one page, and you add a, an empty purple block, it won't. Does someone have an answer? Um, I'll approach this as a designer. I yeah. Think what might help is, uh, really, you learn something new every day. Maybe what might help is, in terms of reusable blocks, if you have a client and he or she wants to develop a certain style, maybe you want to develop a foundational style guide, and then you're going to be using those reusable blocks according to the, the stated uh, the stated need of, uh, of your client. That way, because um, my understanding of a style guide is that you're not really putting real content there yet. It's really just a placeholder. But mm -hmm. at least when you when you start putting that, you know, committing that to the page, um, you at least have the basic shell of the of the page or the site itself, and then you can just plug in. Um, the content as um, when, when they're available. But let's say like if you have a footer and then you have a global change all across the board, instead of going to every single page, like does it actually carry over if you make one change on like, let's say one page? Right? I've got no answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I've tested it out, but within the same page, the same block will the change will apply, but I haven't tested it from page to page. I'd actually probably recommend building that into your footer itself, not necessarily the content Editor, but yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, the man in, in red, because he red. graciously gave his thoughts. <laughs> Andrea, um, this is all sounds great. And I've just tinkered with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the answer, so I'm asking you. And the question that comes to mind, OK, now we've got a means of styling our pages. So now things are going to change, and everyone's going to start looking sort of like what these tools can do. Mm -hmm. And you, so there will be that kind of look, uh, and then beyond that, my understanding is you can tweak the CSS mm -hmm. and get in there if you know what you're doing. So have you come across as far as styling the page, laying it out, or you've seen something, you go, geez, I wish it could do that, but it can't yet. Oh. Have, have you come across that yourself going, you know what, okay, it still hasn't gotten to the point where, I mean, it's WYSIWYG and all that stuff. Yeah. Where you said, you know, I'd love to move it over here, or I'd love to do that. Anything personal? Um, I think the answer is yes, uh, but that's just always. I'm always thinking about how I can improve, improve my own content, and so things related to. I think the galleries are something that I'd, I'd like to see uh, built on, having more options with multiple images. Um, when I do, you know, I have a travel blog, and sometimes I do product recommendations, and I haven't found a great way to display them without using a plugin. And so I'm excited for more ways to display these images and these dynamic images with text and links um, on a page. But I think that's just like my own personal experience. I do think that as we use it more, again, it's twofold. Like as we use it more, we'll see more opportunities. And we'll also have more people adding to the, the project and fixing things that are annoying or incomplete. Um, that's been, yeah, the images one is one for me, but I know so other people. I guess we're going to expect to see a lot of plugins for this? So I have the Yoast plugin on my, on my website. And they have, you know, I mean, a lot of plugins are developing these Gutenberg blocks. As an example, the Yoast one has um, structured data. So that's one that I saw pop up in my Gutenberg list of blocks. Um, and so I think the more plugins develop specific blocks for Gutenberg, the longer that list is going to be. And the more helpful, because I don't know if you noticed, but when you add a, a block, it'll show you your favorites. And so that's going to help. And uh, you can also type in the name of the block, because I think that list is going to get longer and longer. The more plugins you have on your website that are catering to Gutenberg, so being able to then also organize the blocks that you use most frequently, it's going to be good for the workflow. Mm -hmm. OK. Let's start with the lady here. Um, so I did 20 years in magazine publishing, so mm -hmm. I don't know, reading the room and you know, white space, that kind of thing. Um, but I had to get over it when we started having to design for responsive and for people to look at on their smartphones. Mm -hmm. So what happens to all this beautiful white space and drop caps and you know what whatever's 
when you take it from the desktop, which is where yeah. obviously you're kind of designing that, and somebody's now looking at it on their phone. Yeah, well, like most responsive design, it's like probably just going to stack. Um, so you are going to lose some of that, especially if you're designing really with a desktop in mind. You're not, it's not going to translate perfectly to a tablet or a phone. Um, so I think that, like, like most responsive design, the decision comes, what's the majority of my, um, like what kind of device are the majority of my readers and my visitors looking at my site on? So if it's 90% desktop, then you can spend a lot of time investing in these really beautiful designs and layouts. If it's 90% mobile, then that's something that you're going to want to test right away and see, OK, where is that white space appearing? And I like to say that Gutenberg makes it responsive out of the box, but successful responsive doesn't necessarily mean the same thing for everyone. So for me, if it's not broken, that's great. But you know, for someone else who really wanted that image to appear with a lot of white space underneath, you know, that's maybe some tweaking is going to be required for it to look as good on mobile as it did on desktop. Um, yeah, it's not a great answer, but I'm just, yeah. Um, these uh, blocks, are they access control based? Uh, <laughs> like, could an editor, <clears throat> for example, create a style guide and, yeah. and then lock it down and then an admin, uh, and could an admin person create a style guide? Yeah lock it down and then have an editor or a contributor use the standard. Because if not, you're with, with yeah. like multiple uh, people putting in your content, your site could look pretty ragged. It could look awful, right? Yeah, I actually had the same question asked um, last month. And I think it's such an inter interesting conversation. And I was asking, this afternoon, um, Anthony, who's one of the lead releases for Gutenberg, is giving a talk. And we, I spoke to him about this. Because this is a problem. Right now, there isn't a great way to lock down the Gutenberg controls. Um, and it often creates these, these incomplete flows where someone who doesn't have access to upload to the media library adds a media block, has the option to either upload or pick from the media library. And the media library button works fine, because they can pick. They have that authorization. But then the upload button just gives them this error message. So we're encountering a lot of these situations where there's just a disconnect between, between something that's you know, very locked down and, and the user permissions and the way that we interact with Gutenberg. I don't think we've fixed it yet. But he, Anthony seemed to say that it was something that he was very interested in fixing. And, in, and it's a, something that a, across the board a lot of um, users are going to experience because that's a very common use case. If we develop these, these reusable blocks, if we allow people who are you know, on the marketing team or the content team or something, you know, or an, an intern, you don't want to have everyone using it kind of haphazardly. Um, I don't think it's locked down right now, but I wouldn't be surprised if any of the plugins that currently offer those services on WordPress websites, like ones that do very granular permissions, are going to end up integrating that into Gutenberg in some way. I wouldn't be surprised if that's something they're working on now. The inheritance of these, these blocks, like say you've deployed a block on 30 pages, yeah. and then you say to yourself, well, it'd be nice to have to change that spelling mistake that you put in that yeah. you didn't uh, figure out until the 30th page. Yeah. Um, how does that inheritance work, or do you have to go back to all 30 pages yeah. and, and uh, very That's to very similar to her yeah. question. Yeah. Has anyone played with Gutenberg and seen how, yeah? There's no one really in here. So like, okay. this isn't a shared library that should be encouraged to be used that way. And to Andrea's point, that kind of stuff goes to your theme. Mm. This is, like, think about what this is. This is, would you introduce the same paragraph on multiple blog posts over and over again? No. Is, that, is that something that you normally would do? No, right? like a mid-page blog called to action. Yeah. So, so, so the question is, where does Gutenberg start and where does it end? Mm. Right, where does this idea of the theme design start? It's a very important thing to delineate. And in your mind, this is what I prefer to do, is the theme, think of it as the, the studs of a house, foundation, right, and the walls. Gutenberg is pictures on the walls, your toilet, your sink. Right? You might have the same sink over and over again, maybe, but maybe not. Right? And so the idea of 
changing the studs of your house, you're not going to do that with good work. You're going to do that with your thing. Right? Whereas changing the decorate the, 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 the picture on the wall in the living room or the TV, the TV size in one room, you're going to do that with good work. So it's not a great, great analogy, but the start and end and the start and finish is very important today. Today, it's very important to understand. And if you, and if you don't, like, see if you choose products and tools or make solutions that blur those lines, you will be in trouble. Mm -hmm. I promise. We have meetings in this room with the let's fix our let's let's fix your website. Well, I regularly have people come to me and say, I don't know how to change my home page. How can you possibly not know how to change your home page? I have no idea what a text is for. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that will not happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's go over on that side and then we'll... I have a much simpler question. When you upload the Gutenberg, will it change old posts no. that are on the blog? Can I change old posts that are on the blog? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It, it won't affect your old posts unless you go... And if you have both, you know, the classic editor and the Gutenberg editor, you'll have the option to edit your post which, with whichever editor you want. So then you can go into old posts and uh, transform your paragraphs into blocks. You have a button that will say that, and then you can and then you can Gutenfi Gutenberg fi your old posts or not. Up to you. Yeah. Um, over here. Okay. Uh, I do the website for a media company. You know, CNN, Amazon, all the big giants. You can't just say, "Oops, I fucked up." <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when Guten when five and Gutenberg comes, is it gonna be? You know, every setting is on or off. Because if I have waited and it goes for down for two seconds, I'm mm -hmm. going to get fired. Yeah. If I try the plugin right now, it's going to give me the same effects as when it's in core. Oh, gosh. You know, does anybody get uh, what well, if, if you ever get fired for using Gutenberg, <laughs> you, should no. do it, you should do it on a copy of your production site and see what happens. No, I, I want to try it on, on, on the, the plugin before 5.0 comes next week or, or whenever. Yeah. <laughs> but if it doesn't, if the plugin doesn't screw me up, it's going to be the same code when 5.0 comes in the full core. Supposedly, yeah. yeah. Because imagine the soccer, the soccer who does CNN.com, if they up operate or National Post or whatever, or that's in WordPress, and they, they operate and screw it up just, just for even five minutes. They can not install 5.0 on a production site without testing it. Period. Yeah. Without testing it on a clone version. If your organization <coughs> is big enough to not have a staging site to do your tests, you've got a bigger problem. Well, I have two pastors for posts. <laughs> 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 you have a staging site for the production no, site? No, I don't want to see it. I'm just saying for the day where they can't, I, I can't shut down the site. So tell them to make a staging clone copy of your site and yeah. test it there before you upgrade to 5.0. Period. You should do that all the time. Because the, even, even the theme that, that we have, it, you know when you look on the theme on, on WordPress or Word, mm -hmm. there's, there's no tag saying it's Gutenberg <laughs> right. ready. That, that yeah. They haven't done that. The geniuses of that automatic haven't done that. So I would, you know. I would yeah. Focus. Like with any big change, yeah, you have to test it. You have to go if with a big site like that. You want to be really careful. Um, Okay, thanks.